you on today's webinar. We've got lots of, uh, of you enrolled. Many of you are still logging on right now. And so we're, we're so terribly excited to have a great partner of the PCPCC with us today and certainly an expert that many of you have heard from before, um, both at our conferences and on other webinars and certainly all around the country. So I'll be giving a more formal introduction to Dr. McClellan in just a moment here. But as you know, today's webinar is focused on one of the probably one of the hottest topics here at the PCPCC these days, ACOs and payment reform. Um, so you're going to get a great deal of information today. Um, specifically, Dr. McClellan is going to be talking about the recommendations that were released in their, actually just recently released back in November, their ACO Learning Network Toolkit. Um, but really talking more specifically about the roles of primary care in the ACOs and in other types of payment re reform and new payment um, models of care. So um, I'm not going to speak a whole lot, but I do want to give a quick uh, reminder to all of you. I don't think it's probably at all possible for any of you who are receiving our communications to not know that we released our annual report on the evidence of patient-centered medical homes last Friday. We had a fantastic briefing up on the Hill with some great participation. Uh, we have lots of information about that up on our website and, of course, the full report in and of itself. So if by some strange chance you hadn't had an opportunity to already take a look at it, I encourage you to go on our website or you can find it on Facebook or through our Twitter feeds. Lots of information. Download the report. We hope that it will be a useful tool to you and your organization and your partners on really helping to remind everyone that this is a model that is working. We're so excited by all the findings that came out this year, both in the peer-reviewed literature and in industry reports, and of course, lots of fantastic state evaluations. States are doing some just incredible work um, as it relates to um, innovations in primary care and patient-centered medical homes. So again, I encourage you to go and take a look at that. We will actually have a full video of the briefing that took place on Friday up on our website very soon. We're just trying to get it in a format that will be easy for you to, to download on your computer. So, so keep an eye out for that if you want to um, enjoy listening to all the great panelists that we had as part of that briefing. So just one more quick reminder for those of you who might not have participated in one of our webinars before. Um, because we have so many people participate, we are not allowed to have the option to do a live asking of questions for Dr. McClellan. But what we encourage you to do is in the chat or the question box, you can type in your question. And you can type it in at any time it pops into your mind or you're thinking about it throughout the presentation. And then about 10 or 15 minutes uh, towards the end of the hour, I will start reading off those questions to Dr. McClellan um, to respond to. Um, quite often, we don't have an opportunity to answer everybody's questions. We'll do the best we can. Um, and if you have some burning questions that don't get answered after the webinar, you can certainly direct those um, to staff here at the PCPCC, and we'll do the best we can to get those answered for you. Now, it is with great pleasure that I formally introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Mark McClellan who is, of course, Senior Fellow and Director of the Healthcare Innovation and Value Initiative at the Brookings Institution. Within Brookings, Dr. McClellan's work focuses on promoting quality and value in patient-centered healthcare. A doctor and economist by training, he also has a highly distinguished record in public service and in academic research, which I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with. But if you'd like to get more information about Dr. McClellan's background and work, you can also find that on our website. So, Dr. McClellan, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Um, well, th thank you very much. A special thanks to uh, PCPCC, Amy, Caroline, uh, Marcy Nielsen, who we really enjoy working closely with. Uh, we've uh, been collaborating not only on issues related to medical homes and ACO reforms, but uh, j just last week worked together on an event on Capitol Hill on SDR reform, which will be on our website later today if any of you all are interested. Um, it's been a great collaboration because of the tight alignment around uh, uh, better support for primary care being a core for driving overall health care reform. Uh, it's also been a, a, a challenging journey. Uh, you all mentioned some of the recent reports out on uh, um, uh, the PCPCC's review of the evidence on medical homes, uh, other uh, reports out recently, too, showing, again, some promising results, uh, but some uh, uh, further steps definitely that 
need to be addressed. And the same thing is true as you'll see in some of the early results on ACOs that I want to present to you in the next few minutes. Um, and I think it really does highlight the, the importance of synergies between efforts uh, around the medical home and, and uh, the, the proven and, and uh, uh, effective elements of a, of, of a PCMH. Uh, and uh, the ability to link those to some of the other reforms that can be part of a, a good accountable care strategy to align um, not just primary care providers, but all healthcare providers working together to get to better care and lower costs. So, so that's what I want to focus on uh, during uh, my remarks to today. And I'm going to start out just with a little bit of an overview of uh, different alternative payment models. There, there's a lot out there, uh, a lot of discussions around, you know, SDR reform as, as well as uh, ACOs and many other payment models and how we kind of see them fitting together. And then want to spend a little bit of time on early ACO evidence that's even uh, more limited since many of these ACO formal implementa implementations have started uh, just in the last few years. It's even more limited than a lot of the evidence that exists on medical homes, but I think we're seeing some similar kinds of themes starting to emerge. And then, uh, as, uh, as you heard, I want to talk about some of the tools that we're developing, hopefully in closer collaboration uh, going forward with PCC, PCPCC around helping to lead physician ACOs in overcoming the challenges of improving care and lowering costs. And as you'll see, uh, a lot of the physician-led ACOs have an awful lot in common with primary care medical home practices. In fact, many of these, especially in the private sector, have started out as primary care medical homes, and uh, many of the primary care medical home pain reforms are now being used in conjunction with uh, ACO reforms for similar for the same uh, same groups. And if I have a few minutes at the end, we'll talk about some next steps about where things go from here, both in terms of overall policy and. Uh, how we want to keep working uh, together with PCPCC. Um, so in, in terms of a, a range of alternative payment models, you know, there's a lot out there that uh, usually gets characterized as not being fee-for-service. And we view most of those as being in the uh, direction of trying to tie payments more directly to what we really want in care. Um, uh, better quality, better results, better outcomes for patients, lower costs, you know, the triple aim uh, kinds of uh, goals. In the pain reforms that we see, uh, many of them have started out as uh, kind of add-ons to, to fee-for-service. So uh, fee-for-service payment systems are, are well-established. People are used to them. They understand uh, they're not going to get paid for a lot of things that do matter for patient care, but at least they're, uh, they've had a lot of experience and, and uh, no, uh, uh, no, don't face the, the same level of uncertainty as with uh, new payment mechanisms that really move uh, far in the direction of accountability and payment based on uh, results rather than, uh, um, uh, the, than kind of input. Uh, so many of these uh, reforms start out with kind of add-ons. Um, some of the ones we see a lot are clinical pathways. I think some of the early, uh, we call it here traditional, I don't mean that as a pejorative term, but uh, patient-centered medical homes that are about uh, meeting, say, NCQA characteristics for practice capabilities, electronic records, features, uh, and, and, and things like that, uh, often have been implemented through uh, additional payments, uh, PMPMs, uh, that represent start away from fee-for-service, start to an alternative, um, and sort of end up working like on, on this chart. So if you think about like all the payments involved in healthcare, which is what we ought to be caring about, physician payments, and especially physician uh, payments to primary care physicians, are just a tiny part of the total, and it's really the total that we want to focus on, uh, uh, on influencing, uh, these kinds of add-on types of uh, payment models, including a case management fee or uh, something like a, uh, um, a uh, medical home uh, payment um, would have, uh, um, sorry, I think to have uh, gone ahead a little bit far on the slide, let me get back to where I want to be. Um, uh, these uh, add-on payments might uh, reduce uh, uh, overall cost uh, because they lead to fewer preventable hospitalizations, less duplication of services, all the kinds of things that the triple aim should be about. Um, and uh, that, that's great. Uh, but as we've seen in, in some implementations, at least, uh, that additional payment doesn't necessarily translate into uh, uh, an overall reduction in spending. 
I think that's, that's one reason why many payers and, and others have been interested in kind of doing more significant shifts uh, away from the, the, the fee-for-service based system. Uh, I want to talk about shared savings, which is where a lot of this uh, shifting starts, and then uh, uh, bigger payment shifts uh, built on that. Um, the idea behind shared savings is not that there is any additional payment uh, up front in a pure shared savings system, like a pure Medicare shared savings ACO. Uh, rather, what's set up is a second payment track that activates if overall costs come down. So uh, that's really good in the sense that it uh, builds uh, overall costs directly into uh, the payment reforms. That's definitely a shift to uh, uh, accountability away from fee-for-service. It's also really challenging in that it means that practices that are trying to get savings have to find a way uh, typically with whatever upfront resources and, and uh, uh, efforts uh, uh, they can, you know, financial uh, resources, time, energy, otherwise, uh, to reform care in the hopes of getting uh, these kinds of payment reforms later. So it's a bit more comfortable from a standpoint of a payer. That's why when I was at CMS, you know, my actuaries liked uh, these models a lot better than the, uh, than, than the ones that started out with add-ons. Uh, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, it, it means that you you do get uh, additional revenues, but only to the extent that uh, overall costs come down, and that uh, there are also improvements in uh, measurable the, the measured aspects of, of quality along the way. Um, so this is where most ACOs have started out. This is where we started the Medicare Physician Group Practice demonstration. That was a forerunner of ACOs back around 2006. Uh, this is where the vast majority of Medicare ACOs are today. But what we're starting to see, especially outside of Medicare, is a lot more organizations moving into shared risk uh, or more of a, a case or episode-based uh, approach to payment. And you know, what I mean by that is that, um, that the payments really are beginning to shift away from uh, fee-for-service. So instead of having uh, uh, you know, maybe 100% of the fee-for-service rates, uh, many organizations are uh, taking on uh, accountability where they're uh, for overall cost increases, so they don't get uh, a payment increase, they don't get an increase in their fee-for-service rate unless uh, the overall spending for their patients is within uh, uh, the, the target benchmark. Uh, that means if uh, the, the patients have higher overall costs, uh, uh, the uh, physician groups, uh, the um, uh, accountable care groups face a downside financial risk uh, for those patients. And I think that's you know, that, that is a new kind of, of risk. That is new uncertainty. Why would organizations do this? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is um, it's more comfortable for, for payers if they uh, aren't just doing, a, you know, a heads uh, I lose, uh, tails uh, I don't win approach. But there, there really is, you know, more of a, a shared risk and uh, uh, less, uh, uh, consequentially, less uh, um, risk of uh, financial loss for the payers. But uh, what I think is really in it for the providers is that it is freeing to have more flexibility to de-link the resources you get from stuff that gets paid for under traditional payment systems. It's much easier if you have a kind of partial capitation payment system like this, a system where your, your whole add-on is based on the overall cost of care and is not in any way tied to fee-for-service. Uh, it's a lot easier to do things like redesign practices or uh, um, invest in uh, uh, remote monitoring equipment, things that are not paid for at all under fee-for-service. Uh, you have more flexibility to, to uh, redesign care in those directions. It does come with the additional financial risk, so it's risk versus flexibility. Uh, but what we've seen is as more organizations get experience with understanding uh, their, their overall patient population, understanding what's going on in a graphic like this one, you know, where the total cost being incurred, where the best opportunities for quality improvement, uh, they do get more comfortable and more confident that the steps they're going to take to redesign care and really shift resources around are going to make a positive difference. And so we're seeing more organizations, ACOs, take on this kind of risk, uh, especially in the uh, private sector. Um, uh, one way to get there uh, is uh, this graph uh, shows maybe starting out with uh, a, a, a primary care uh, uh, management uh, fee, a PMPM fee with the expectation that that's going to transition over time or, or be implemented with uh, some overall accountability for, uh, for costs uh, and uh, maybe transition over time away from uh, relying uh, so much on fee-for-service towards a, 
uh, larger case fees and, and smaller fee-for-service payments uh, still with the opportunity for, for shared savings. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Blue Cross Alternative Quality Contract, uh, that's what they've done. Uh, start out with some upfront support for uh, primary care practices to help them implement the kinds of things that make a difference in a, a primary care medical home, but didn't stop there. Uh, they also included some uh, shared savings components and increasingly over time have held uh, practices accountable for uh, keeping overall spending growth down. So it's exactly as uh, uh, illustrated in, in this chart. Uh, so it's a, just an illustration of how these different reforms really can and, and, and should, uh, we think, fit together. Uh, one more point uh, about general concepts here, and I want to move on to the results, um, is that um, there, there are complementary payment reforms, like bundled payments for specialists, uh, um, PMPMs that are shared between primary care providers and specialists that also can be implemented along with ACOs as they move beyond just that simple step of adding on a shared savings payment to fee for service and it can facilitate bigger reforms in care, more alignment between primary care physicians and, and specialists and, and hospitals and, and post-acute care providers and others. And I don't know that, uh, you know, some people think, oh, we're on this march all the way up to comprehensive uh, capitated payments. I don't think that's necessarily the, the, the place where um, all practices and, and, you know, are going to sort out, and that's not necessarily the place that the most efficient and effective way to pay for medical care. And maybe somewhere in between, but I do think it's going to end up being significantly farther away from just uh, fee-for-service and just add-on payments and just shared savings uh, than what we see today as these kinds of experiences uh, accumulate. So where are we with uh, uh, the uh, overall uh, ACO experience and, and uh, overcoming some of these challenges? Well, uh, here at Brookings, uh, we've been sponsoring with uh, assistance from a, a lot of other experts, an ACO learning network for quite some time. Uh, this slide shows uh, uh, how to get in touch with us if you'd like to find out more. I'll come back to this at the end, but uh, uh, this has been a, a great opportunity to bring together a number of organizations, uh, uh, physician groups, integrated systems, uh, specialists who are working with these groups, uh, uh, others, uh, health plans, payers, others who are involved in uh, trying to drive these reforms in care effectively to exchange ideas, to uh, 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 collect uh, um, uh, and review results and to provide tools that can be used to help uh, further the efforts around accountable care organization uh, reforms. Um, as part of this network's uh, efforts, um, we've uh, uh, been able to review a lot of the early evidence on ACOs. I'm just going to talk briefly here about some of the evidence from the Medicare ACO program. You all may have seen uh, some of this presented earlier, uh, the, the uh, first year findings, this is basically over, off the first year or so uh, contract period, so that out of the 220 ACOs in Medicare from the beginning uh, in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, uh, about a quarter of them uh, got enough uh, reductions in their spending trends against their benchmark uh, to qualify for those shared savings. Again, these are essentially all uh, shared savings uh, uh, ACOs with just uh, a few exceptions that have moved into that further step of, uh, uh, of shared risk. Um, most of them have uh, uh, gotten uh, reduced spending uh, uh, beyond the, below their benchmark, but some not uh, uh, all the way uh, to qualify for shared savings. That's a 2% threshold so that uh, the savings don't get paid out just because of uh, some small random variations in payments. Um, interestingly, among the um, uh, ACOs uh, divided by size, and this is in terms of number of Medicare beneficiaries, uh, some of the, the biggest savings in the first year occurred in the smallest ACOs. And um, these are typically ACOs that do not include hospitals or integrated health systems. Um, the, the Medicare program right now, as I'll come back to, is uh, a little bit more than half uh, made up of ACOs that consist of physician groups. That's uh, always uh, a primary care group or, or several groups uh, collaborating together in a region or in some cases sharing tools and resources and approaches, uh, you know, infrastructure across regions. Um, uh, always includes a, a primary care core, uh, primary care physician core. Some of them also include uh, some specialists uh, uh, as well. 
Uh, as you get to the larger ACOs, those are uh, typically more physician-hospital collaborations, or as I said, uh, more uh, integrated systems. Uh, and we're still very early on. This is the first year, but uh, uh, the, the significant average savings uh, in what amounted to about a 1% or so uh, overall uh, reduction in, in Medicare spending from this first year, 1% to 2%, uh, was driven primarily by those uh, uh, smaller ACOs. Um, this is uh, another chart, and by the way, these are taken from a, um, a uh, if you want more information, a health affairs blog that we posted at uh, uh, healthaffairs.org on uh, uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago on these uh, uh, early results through, uh, uh, through 2013. Um, uh, what this shows is uh, not a very strong relationship, but nonetheless, if you look closely and trust me on the statistics, a positive relationship between uh, the per capita expected spending, in other words, the benchmark that the ACOs had and their, um, uh, uh, their, their realized uh, savings uh, uh, on, a, uh, 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 on a percentage basis relative to their benchmarks. Uh, point here, one of the concerns about the ACO program uh, was that uh, ACOs benchmarks were set relative to the baseline spending for the beneficiaries who were attributed to them. And as you know, there's a large amount of variation in baseline spending. A good bit of it's associated with geographic region. A lot of it's associated with variations across practice groups within a region. In the first phase of the ACO program, uh, the, the benchmarks in Medicare were based on where you started from. And it does look like from this chart that the ACOs that started from a little bit higher, from a bit higher benchmark level did a little bit better. But what we also want to convey in this chart is that the vast majority of variation in performance was not explained by uh, having a, a higher baseline or higher benchmark to start from. Uh, the other uh, important point from these early results, uh, or another important point, is that uh, the ACOs are able to do quite well in terms of their performance measures. So as many of you know, there were 33 performance measures included in the Medicare ACO program. Um, some of these are prevention-oriented, like use of screening uh, tests. Uh, many of them are related to patient experience, uh, the HCAPS uh, uh, medical groups uh, surveys. Many of them are related to uh, proximate and uh, um, uh, more significant utilization outcomes, things like hemoglobin A1C control in diabetics and uh, cholesterol control in patients with um, uh, uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, as well as uh, outcomes like uh, hospitalization rates with preventable uh, hospitalizations. And uh, in general, these are percentages relative to the overall uh, Medicare population where common measures can be calculated. In general, the ACOs did substantially better, as you can see, this big shift up towards the higher part of the distribution with uh, most of the ACOs performing at the 70th, 80th percentile or, or more. Uh, relative to the whole distribution of quality in these important measure dimensions compared to providers in the overall Medicare program. So uh, early results uh, are limited amount of savings driven by a subset of the ACOs, particularly small ACOs, um, uh, but uh, nonetheless non-trivial savings and significantly higher performance in terms of quality. Uh, what this chart shows is what we, di what we are not seeing is a, any kind of correlation between higher performance on quality and percentage savings. And I think this goes along with some results that we've seen with PCMHs and other programs where it is certainly possible uh, to get better quality uh, without necessarily lowering costs at the same time. And one of the key challenges for all of these payment reforms is how to identify you know, what it is uh, that organizations that are in the um, uh, top uh, right of this chart, what it is that they're doing uh, that's enabling them to get bigger savings uh, and higher quality performance at the same time. It's clearly not so simple as just you know checking off doing well on a set of quality measures. Uh, there are other practical steps that clearly need to go along with it. As part of our efforts of looking into this, uh, we're, we're focusing on those physician-led ACOs since there seem to be some really uh, promising results in, uh, in some of them, uh, even the uh, the smaller ones, and since, as I mentioned, this is where a lot of the growth is occurring. Uh, more than half of Medicare ACOs are physician-led. Many of the private plan uh, accountable care programs and all the private insurers have uh, uh, ACO programs now. 
Uh, those are focusing on physician-led groups. I think, uh, frankly, the private insurers feel a bit more comfortable dealing with organizations that are not uh, uh, gigantic uh, in, uh, in terms of market size and, mar and potentially market power uh, and uh, want to work uh, directly with uh, physician-led groups. So we're seeing a lot of interest from the, the private plans in, in further developing these ACOs as well. Um, what makes them different? Well, um, you've got the physicians right in the management uh, of, of the ACO. Uh, that kind of proximity makes a big difference. Uh, we also had a paper in JAMA uh, last year that highlighted a, another difference compared to hospital-based systems, which is in terms of uh, calculating uh, shared savings that, that can result from interventions and activities of the ACO. Uh, if your ACO is just made up of physicians and you take steps to reduce hospitalization rate, all of those savings translate into the bottom line shared savings for the ACO. As we showed in the paper, uh, reducing hospitalization rates by just uh, 1 or 2 percent uh, could potentially lead to doubling of uh, net revenues for a physician practice because uh, uh, those uh, uh, hospitalizations can be so costly. In contrast, for an integrated uh, system ACO that includes hospitals as well as physicians, as doing shared savings, uh, there, there are two effects going on. There's the savings that comes from preventing the hospitalization, but there also is the, and, and that leads to, to shared savings revenues, but there's also the, the lost direct revenue from not having the admission. And whether that's uh, going to end up being a big driver in more success uh, it remains to be seen. It does seem to be, a, a, like, at least as we've said, a, a suggestive factor in some of the uh, early results. Um, we have some more. Um, it, information on, on this uh, slide as to what uh, uh, the uh, successful ACOs are doing. Um, but what I wanted to turn to is, uh, is pointing out that, that not all uh, of the physician-led ACOs are, have been successful. And in our learning network efforts, this is much more case and, and sort of uh, uh, interaction based than and just you know, uh, putting a few numbers on a chart, uh, we've been trying to get a better handle on what is making a difference. Um, some of the early results from, from that effort uh, we released in this uh, uh, guide for physician practices that are adopting uh, becoming ACOs. Uh, this was an effort that um, resulted from our ACO learning network and a, uh, this particular emphasis on physician-led ACO innovation exchange. Uh, we talked a little bit here about how we put all that together um, and uh, we're, we're continuing work uh, in, this, uh, in this area uh, as, as well. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, what we highlighted was four um, particular areas where early ACOs that were having successes seem to be doing some things differently. And these are going to sound a lot like uh, things that you're used to in uh, PCMH implementation because, not surprisingly, those are, those are good ideas. Um, I think the point that I'd like to emphasize is that for the successful ACOs, they, they didn't spend an enormous amount of time or resources making big, trying to make big transformational changes in their practice in a short term, in the short term. Rather, they tended to focus on a limited number of specific steps that based on, based on the, the, the best data they could get, which often was not very good data, maybe it was just kind of intuition or, or looking at some of their um, practice records, but based on the best data they could get uh, and based on uh, looking at some of the existing evidence, uh, working with groups like ours, uh, they identified a limited number of steps that they could take that they thought could have an impact on both the quality measures and the cost trends uh, in the short term. So uh, one clear way to do that is to identify and take steps to affect the treatment of your highest risk patients. Um, now, many of these ACOs uh, were, were, aimed, were hoping to get data from Medicare, you know, comprehensive claims data where they could do uh, fancy risk models and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately for many of them, they, they didn't get the data. Uh, they didn't get uh, complete data, their issues. They didn't get it in a timely way. So some of them uh, turned to some additional short-term steps to try to help close those gaps, things like uh, getting some basic information on their patients that were likely to be risk factors for having uh, uh, higher uh, costs or complications, so family health uh, ACO, which is focused uh, actually as a disproportionate share of lower income patients, uh, put some uh, homegrown efforts into doing that. Uh, Crystal Run Healthcare um, had uh, the, the one hiring decision that they focused on. They only had a limited budget uh, that they could uh, devote, that they could pull together to support this effort, but the one 
hire that they did make was a nurse practitioner uh, to follow up specifically uh, with their patients who were hospitalized, and particularly with patients uh, who were hospitalized that had some of these other um, uh, clear and apparent uh, uh, risk factors. Uh, those kinds of interventions help them get measurable reductions uh, in their hospitalization rate, and thus those significant savings uh, in the short term. Second big area, as I, I know you all are familiar with, uh, the concept of the medical neighborhood. Uh, uh, we tend to think of it as uh, creating a, a high-value network. Uh, you cannot deliver uh, uh, effective care uh, alone, as, as, as you know, and while primary care should be the hub of it, the more that you can actively engage and work with specialists, uh, um, uh, the more effective uh, a, a, a delivery form effort, and in, in this case, an, an ACO can be. Uh, there is a long list of things in this chapter that uh, ACOs can do in the short term uh, to uh, understand how to improve outcomes and lower costs uh, for, uh, as a result of their specialty interactions. You know, some of these things are just as simple as uh, uh, looking at some basic data on uh, the uh, readmission rate um, or just the overall cost of the specialists that you work with. Uh, they differ enormously, uh, many of the ACOs found. Uh, some of it's pretty simple, like uh, uh, working with specialists that um, uh, deliver care uh, to perform uh, ambulatory surgery procedures in their office versus in a hospital outpatient department where the facility fees can make a big difference in cost. Uh, um, SNF providers turn out to have quite significant variations around the country in how often they readmit, uh, their patients are readmitted to, uh, to the hospital. So just some basic gather, data gathering like that can help. Uh, but what also matters is bringing in specialists uh, uh, to the ATO. You can do that directly by having a, um, a partnership with some selected uh, specialists uh, within the ATO itself and start sharing the, the savings with you, and you can uh, uh, provide some more uh, support and opportunities for collaboration. Um, sometimes it's, uh, ACOs have done it through uh, more selective uh, uh, kind of collaboration approaches. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, Palm Beach ACO worked out arrangements with several of the particular nursing homes uh, in their um, areas and some of the, the home health provider, providers in their areas where they could work more closely with them to make sure information was, was transferred, uh, even round on uh, the patients in the skilled nursing facility. Again, you've you got to pick these battles carefully as you only got limited resources, uh, but these are examples that have turned out to, to lead to significant uh, uh, short-term savings as well as uh, uh, improved outcomes in terms of uh, fewer, uh, fewer admissions and, and fewer readmissions. Um, in the ideal world, and there was just an IT, uh, health IT interoperability roadmap released. Uh, everybody's going to have uh, quick information on what exactly is going on with their patients anywhere. Uh, we do not live in that world uh, today. Um, some ACOs uh, were in, uh, lucky enough to be in states where there is some basic uh, health information exchange. Uh, turns out some of the most expensive, most important information to get quickly there is information on when patients are admitted, discharged, uh, uh, and transferred. Uh, ACOs that can get that quickly have been able to intervene in the emergency room, uh, get patients, uh, you know, head off admissions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, shorten the stays or, or improve the, the discharge planning for patients who, who do end up uh, uh, needing to get uh, admitted. Um, and there's some, uh, some examples in, the, uh, in our report of, of how to do that when you can't actually, uh, when, when your state doesn't have a system in place. Uh, there, there are a lot of tricks to, to, to get there now that can, make, uh, that can make a real difference. And then the fourth big area that we wanted to, to highlight where a, a lot of ACOs are quite uh, uh, active is uh, in really engaging uh, their patients. So, uh, some of this is about uh, complex patients. We've talked about that earlier, about sort of special outreach to them. But there are other ways to reach a, a broader range of, uh, uh, of uh, Medicare beneficiaries as well. Um, got some ex examples of that on this slide, um, uh, patient portals for uh, patients to uh, keep in touch with you about their health status. Again, doesn't have to do everything, just some uh, targeted information that can help with uh, follow-up interventions and further engagement. Um, patient surveys uh, have been a really good way to engage uh, patients and help uh, uh, decide exactly how to, to, to redesign a, a practice. Um, one ACO's uh, patient engagement strategy was around as another way of getting at um, uh, early notification for patients that might be headed to the emergency room. Uh, one ACO's uh, strategy here was to, to let the 
uh, their patients know that uh, if they ever thought they needed to call uh, 911 to call them first, so it's sort of the exact opposite of uh, what you often get on the, you know, the, the medical office uh, recorded voicemails. You know, if this is a medical emergency, hang up now and call 911. You're saying the opposite strategy here, if it's a medical emergency, call me immediately. Uh, they arrange for physicians in the group to answer those calls directly. Uh, and if necessary, the, the physician would go to the patient's home, would go to the emergency room. That was one of their big uh, interventions. They were able to substantially reduce uh, ED visit rates uh, and uh, substantially reduce admissions. Of course, if the patient really needed to go to the emergency room, they'd get them uh, right there. You know, if the patient was an extremist or otherwise, get them right to the emergency room, but the, the physician would be notified to come over and uh, uh, join them. And it, uh, it worked out quite well as a sort of quick, low-tech alternative to the, the further steps uh, that uh, as you get more shared savings, you start to move your um, uh, delivery system, your, your delivery uh, of care away from traditional fee-for-service. You can do more of those advanced things, but these are all steps that could be undertaken in the short term. Um, uh, obviously, uh, this is a really challenging uh, uh, area. Um, physician groups have limited resources now, and not only uh, often dependent on fee-for-service, but on continually tightened uh, fee-for-service payment rates. Uh, so it is hard on top of all that and just getting by in practice to figure out uh, what feasible interventions can be undertaken to succeed uh, in an ACO arrangement, which ones get uh, uh, return on investment, which should be done first, but uh, again, there's growing evidence that I've hopefully started to illustrate uh, on how to go about answering those questions. Um, having a, a clear strategy, uh, not just in the short term, but, but where you're aiming to go uh, for uh, reforming your practice is, is also critical so that those feasible steps you take along the way uh, are really getting you to, to, to where you want to, to be. Uh, and then, you know, I started out, uh, or sorry, I talked today about some of the uh, sort of rudimentary versions of, of using data to, to transform care. Uh, obviously, there, there are more advanced ways to build on this, even if you don't have a full electronic uh, uh, interoperable record capability through uh, uh, some more limited registries and, and uh, other steps. And there are a lot of uh, organizations now forming to help physician uh, groups in, in undertaking uh, these activities. Uh, but this is very much a work in progress. Uh, right now, Medicare has a, a proposed regulation on the streets for uh, sort of the Medicare ACO program version 2.0. Uh, this slide goes through uh, what we think some of the, the, the big themes uh, uh, for uh, improving the, the Medicare program should be uh, based on these uh, early experiences. Uh, uh, for example, uh, a lot of the uh, challenges that ACOs have faced we think are uh, sort of avoidable uh, uh, barriers that, that could be a, a addressed through just a specific set of steps to make the uh, ACO benchmarks and the patients that you're caring for and uh, uh, your, your, where you are in terms of uh, performance relative to benchmarks more clear, uh, as well as uh, some additional opportunities to engage patients, to, uh, to move up that scale that I was talking about earlier towards more shift away from fee-for-service, which again is going to mean uh, in general, taking on uh, new kinds of financial risks, but uh, ways to make that uh, uh, understandable and feasible. Um, there's some good lessons from the, the commercial ACO side uh, in this area as well uh, uh, that uh, uh, deserve uh, further analysis and, uh, uh, and, and learning. Um, and uh, as part of these efforts to uh, um, uh, gain uh, more insights about where things should go, I'm starting having a little bit of trouble uh, advancing the, the slide now. Um, we are undertaking some more efforts in our ACO learning network around uh, physician-led activities. So there's a, a list of some of these uh, uh, activities taking place now. You can think of it as uh, building on that uh, toolkit and those, uh, those uh, strategies that uh, we've identified so far that uh, physician-led ACOs are using to improve care. Um, in undertaking this, uh, where we are have started to, to partner more extensively with uh, uh, PCPCC, uh, thanks to PCPCC's great experience with uh, identifying best practices and successful strategies for implementing uh, primary care medical homes. As I hope I've made very clear, quite synergistic uh, with the, the, the tools and approaches and strategies that seem to be most effective in implementing physician-led ACOs, and we expect to see more of that work coming soon. So uh, I'm sorry, I've talked a little bit longer than I expected, but I uh, tried to cover a lot of ground about where 
uh, accountable care type payment reform seem to be headed, uh, what the experience with physician-led ACOs has been so far, and what some of the, the, the next steps and, and opportunities for overcoming the challenges might be. Uh, this, is, this is hard work. Uh, there, there are uh, a lot of, uh, um, I'm not sure I'd say failures, but uh, uh, a lot of organizations that haven't seen uh, the, the, the clear payoff yet. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we are definitely learning more about what can work, and there are a growing number of uh, successful models of payment reform and then physician-led uh, uh, groups, physician-led ACOs built on primary care medical home concepts uh, that are definitely succeeding in, this, uh, in these reform efforts. So thank you all very much for the opportunity to join you. I'd be happy to answer some uh, questions at this point. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McClellan. This has been fantastic information, and I have no doubt that people are going to be downloading this, this toolkit and getting a lot more information on how they can take some of these strategies and really implement them where they're at and within their organizations. Um, as you can imagine, this presentation has generated quite a level of interest and questions. I'm going to apologize right away because for sure we will not be able to tackle all of them. And I will warn you also, they're not all very easy questions to answer, but um, I know you'll do your best. I'm going to start um, asking some of those questions. If you do have additional questions you'd like to ask, go ahead and continue to add them into the question box. But just as a quick start, and I'm going to summarize several kind of questions that have a similar theme. When you talked about some of the things that ACOs were doing or health systems were doing, maybe even individual physician practices were doing, did you see or ha are you starting to see any emerging, emerging evidence as it relates to the integration of specific roles or services into the ACO models? So for instance, are you seeing that the addition of the role of the pharmacist is, as being more integral to the care team? Are you seeing um, changes in costs as it relates to medication usage or even um, the adherence to medication prescriptions, that type of thing? Are you seeing um, changes as it relates to cost by the introduction of strong palliative care services? We even have a question related to the integration of behavioral health um, into ACOs. Are you yeah. starting to look at any of the more um, experiences related to those particular services or, or additions to the care team? Yeah, I think it's 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 probably too early, or or at least I can't make any generalization about um, which of those um, changes in care team would have the biggest payoff for doing first. Uh, I would say that all uh, of these ACOs that are you know making significant progress have adopted a more team-based approach to care, and um, for some it's uh, just within the for the traditional staff they might hire, they might hire more of them, so. Um, uh, uh, increase the responsibilities for their nurse practitioners. Uh, I gave some examples of that from our uh, toolkit, and there are more in there. Um, uh, even um, relying on frontline health workers, uh, medical assistants can be very helpful uh, with just, uh, it, it takes a, a bit of training, but there are good programs out for, and good models out for this now, but medical assistants can be very helpful for following up with patients about things like medication adherence uh, and, and the like. Um, we've seen um, ACOs, especially the ones that are a bit larger and more established, uh, build out uh, um, more um, uh, uh, broader teams that, that include uh, uh, pharmacists, that include um, uh, um, behavioral health uh, interactions and the like. Um, so I think all of that's sort of directionally right. I, I, I don't have a, a good short answer as to uh, which kind of um, uh, intervention is best. I would say that for some of the ACOs that are um, engaged primarily with low-income populations, um, the best first hire is often a social worker uh, who can help make sure that um, you know patients who are showing up in an emergency room are um, uh, getting uh, you know have a place to, to go home if they have uh, substance abuse uh, or other uh, mental health issues. They get connected with uh, uh, community programs. Um, and it can just provide some help in uh, stabilizing where often unstable situations uh, uh, outside of, of the health system that you know, result in uh, more use of the, uh, of the health system. I think that the basic lesson is definitely build out a team approach. Make sure that if someone else can do your job uh, as well or at a lower cost than you can, uh, start to try to shift that, uh, shift that over. And, uh, um, uh, additional use of nurse practitioners, additional use of uh, 
uh, case uh, managers for, for higher risk patients, uh, additional use of other staff, uh, medical assistants, pharmacists, uh, and the like, uh, and social workers can all help with that. Fantastic. And I, I think this might build on, on what you just described in regards to how ACOs are kind of tackling these changes in care models. But there's a question asking for you to clarify the statement as it relates to focusing on smart first steps versus broad transformation efforts, um, trying to understand kind of the, the separation or how we might, um, how organizations are looking at that, that overall journey to larger practice transformation. Um, and, and I'm yeah. just thinking on one of the examples you used is don't tell them to call 911. Actually, you know, <laughs> change your access points for, for yeah. the services. Yeah, I mean, there. I, I, I guess the theme is uh, that, that I really do want to get across, especially for these, these um, you know, physician groups that may not have the, the, the benefits of, of, you know, sort of fully integrated support staff and that certainly have the vision for, for getting to uh, uh, transform models of care. Um, that's great. You need to have the vision, but you know, I think one of the general challenges in, in healthcare and certainly in health policy is not that we don't know where we want to be. It's just that it's awfully hard to get from here to there. So you know, five or ten years from now, um, you know, if you want to um, implement a transform practice, uh, there will, I'm sure, be some you know very well written guidebooks. There will be standard ways of sharing uh, the key information that you need. There will be you know, nice, well-established alternatives to CPT and ICD-9 codes that reliably capture you know, things that we really care about, uh, like uh, patient uh, results and, and health uh, and functional status and, and, and health status and the like. But that's not the world we live in today. So um, the, what makes this hard for people who are going down this road now is that you, you've got to keep the, the long-term goal in mind, but you, you do need to think about the specific steps to get there. Um, I, you know, it, it, again, it's kind of early to say with a lot of these ACOs since they've just been around for a couple of years and everybody does ascribe to, you know, we want to get to the triple aim, we, we like all the principles in a primary care medical home, we, we want to get to, you know, fully integrated service capabilities. Um, but uh, I think you just have to live with the fact that, that for in most cases, we're just, uh, in most of the practice, we're just not... Uh, not there right now, and and that's okay. It's, it's hard, but it, it, it's okay because it is uh, possible to uh, to make progress. So I just would encourage you know keeping those long-term transformational goals in mind, um, but but don't expect that you know unless you've got an awful lot of uh, free money and time lying around, uh, don't expect that just you can you know plan on building up a uh, a whole system uh, and and uh, have it ready uh, ready to go right away. It's it's going to be a gradual process. Um, you know, my guess is what is going to look like optimal practice uh, um, structures are going to change over time. So you know, maybe it's uh, uh, an integrated office today. Maybe a few years from now, it's uh, a small uh, uh, virtual you know primarily virtual office with some. Uh, um, you know, access to frontline health workers in the community, and a lot more reliance on uh, home-based care. Um, you need to have some flexibility in in, in getting there, and and uh, um, uh, it doesn't make it easy. But hopefully, some of these uh, steps will help move in the right direction. Well, and I think another question that that builds on that is understanding and appreciating that different care providers, different health systems, they're all at different points along their trajectory in terms of how That's they're exactly changing right. their models of care and delivery. So for those organizations that might be a little further down that path, they've really started to eke out all the cost savings they can as it relates to decreasing ER utilization and they do a great job of transitioning their patients from hospital to home so they're not seeing them being readmitted. So for those organizations, it's becoming more challenging to find those cost savings because they are being more efficient in the way they're delivering care. How are those models going to evolve to continue to reward those health systems that are doing that care in the right way, but yet knowing that there's still some that are lagging behind and, and have some other opportunities for cost savings? Yeah, so How are so that, that is a, yeah, work? that's Great, uh, a great uh, related set of questions that's been a, a main topic of debate and discussion with uh, this next round of uh, um, you know, proposed regulation or proposed uh, structure for, for version 2.0 of the Medicare ACO program. I mean, the way the program's set up today is uh, 
uh, it, it, it's not very forgiving for, for organizations that um, uh, improve care. So I mentioned that, uh, that you know, the Medicare ACO program started by looking at where uh, a group of providers was with their patients um, in most recent years, and then setting their benchmark and rewarding their, you know, ca calculating their shared savings, rewarding their performance based on how they improve from there. Um, what many organizations are understandably worried about is, well, you know, it's great um, because, you know, we were able to show some improvements and get some savings, but now um, the benchmark is going to be ratcheted down, and, um, uh, and that just doesn't seem fair, especially if, I'm, if I've been taking all these steps to get costs down and improve outcomes. Um, you know, there's uh, um, one of the Pioneer ACOs, uh, Sharp, in uh, San Diego ended up dropping out of the Pioneer program because they found that, you know, because they were uh, basically being penalized for gains against their already uh, low benchmark, uh, they could get paid more if they switched into the Medicare Advantage program in, in San Diego where the benchmark was set based on uh, kind of average cost in the region. Um, I think the way that policies are going to evolve to deal with this is to uh, sort of count both to some extent. So um, uh, there, I think there will continue to be in a lot of these accountable care models, you know, the payer question of, well, what have you done for me lately, where um, uh, they'll, they'll want to continue to see some improvements relative to past performance. Uh, but our recommendations for the Medicare program, and I think a lot of others as well, are going to suggest that, look, you also need to find ways of looking at whether the ACOs are performing well uh, compared to other providers. Now, this still doesn't make life easier. Even, you know, it may help, but it still doesn't really solve the problem of, you know, gosh, you've you know, made a lot of progress in uh, reducing admissions and uh, uh, avoiding uh, unnecessary ED visits and, and maybe taking other steps to improve care. Um, I, I do think there's going to be continued pressure there, though. The, um, Pressures of, of rising healthcare costs are not going to go away. We um, are, you know, keeping on discovering some uh, uh, new cures and, and better treatments that often have high costs. The demographics are, are, are working against um, healthcare costs in this country and around the world. And um, you know, I think there's going to be continued pressure to find something, some further step to take to keep building on progress to, to in a, continue to innovate to get uh, more value in healthcare. Um, maybe some good news there is that for some of the um, more effective ACO programs that have been going on for longer, they seem to be finding bigger, not smaller, savings over time. So I mentioned the Massachusetts Blue Cross uh, um, alternative quality contract uh, earlier. They've now reported out four years results and, you know, it was one, one and a half percent in the first year up to over 6% now. Uh, we've had a, a presentation with uh, Intel, which has moved to a direct employer version of, of contracting with uh, healthcare providers to do an ACO. They saw no savings in the first year, the bigger savings in year two, and, and, and then even bigger in year three and beyond. Um, I think it does mean that you're going to have to continue to think bolder. So, you know, whereas uh, maybe in the first couple of years, steps like identifying your high-risk patients and keeping them out of the hospital were enough. Um, steps in years uh, four, five, six, and beyond may be uh, more fundamental shifts in care, uh, changing the way that uh, specialists are used, uh, uh, moving away from uh, office visits towards uh, more home-based uh, or, uh, you know, uh, wireless monitoring, telemedicine, uh, email-based care. And, and that's why I, I really think this shift towards more financial risk uh, is important. Uh, again, the, the downside of that is that, that you're more accountable for the uh, overall costs and, and results for your population of patients. The upside is that the farther payment systems move away from fee-for-service, the easier it is to, to do things and fund uh, initiatives that uh, you just couldn't just get no support under fee-for-service, like an effective telemedicine program or like a program that relies on pharmacists and, and other health professionals in a much more significant way than, you know, we've seen uh, uh, in most cases so far. So, um, you know, the bad news is I think those pressures are going to continue. The good news is that um, we can do a lot to, to, to keep uh, the, 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 um, uh, the overall uh, pressure on, on um, payment rates and, and the overall pressures to restrict access to care down with just a, you know, a couple, you know, one, two percent uh, savings per year. Not, not that easy to do. Uh, continued hard work, but, uh, um, we're, we're seeing examples of organizations being able to continue to pull that off, especially if they 
keep, and they're not afraid to keep moving forward into more significant payment reform. Perfect. And I think we have lots of uh, pediatric friends on the line because I've gotten several questions for you regarding how well or successful this model has been shown with pediatric populations. Can you um, speak to any of the experience or conversations you've had around that, knowing that you know they access and utilize health care services quite differently from elderly populations that have uh, they, they, they sure do. And this is, a, this is still a couple of months off, but in early May we're going to have a webinar focusing on uh, pediatric accountable care, and we're going to highlight some examples that are going on with uh, asthma management, but it's really a more general issue for pediatric practice. So um, there, there are an, uh, some, uh, especially larger uh, pediatric uh, centers, especially uh, some hospital-based centers that have um, moved into uh, much more uh, population-based risk for uh, pediatric patients. Uh, and that's enabled some reforms in care that, again, you know, don't get paid for well under fee-for-service, uh, but that can lead to better outcomes and, and lower costs for a pediatric population. Um, the, the best opportunities for savings there seem to be around uh, asthma, which uh, accounts for uh, a lot of the admissions and, and a really large share of the preventable admissions uh, uh, in kids. Uh, so having a, a nurse practitioner set up, uh, doing some other uh, interventions, which I'll talk more about in a second, um, uh, with uh, at-risk uh, asthma patients that are not, and families that are not paid for under traditional fee-for-service, uh, really can pay off. Other big opportunity for improved outcomes and short-term savings is around uh, um, prenatal and, and perinatal care, where they're kind of accountable care reforms have been impl in, implemented in places like Arkansas that through uh, better uh, um, prenatal care access, including things like you know telemedicine access for remote patients or patients who otherwise have trouble checking in with their uh, making to their appointments and checking with their doctors. It can make a big difference, and and you know, targeted uh, uh, case managers and, and the like as well. Again, all things not paid for uh, under fee for service. Uh, the biggest challenge in, in pediatrics, though, and this is just a big version of a more general challenge with these models, is that a lot of the um, health benefits of better care don't show up in savings in the short term and may not even show up in savings at all. So uh, a lot of the things that um, uh, clinicians try to do to improve care are about preventing, you know, downstream complications like, uh, um, you know, better uh, long-term outcomes from, uh, from high-quality cancer care uh, and the like. And so one of the challenges in um, the, these ACO efforts is to make sure that Patients are informed and engaged about these long-term benefits that, that they can have. So it's not just about short-term savings, but the, the long-term improvements in care that are possible through uh, ACOs. And then in the case of um, pediatric care especially, um, breaking down some more payment silos. Um, some of the um, biggest benefits of better pediatric care are things like um, uh, better preschool participation, uh, better kindergarten readiness, better school participation. They're going to have health benefits way down the road. And this may seem like a bit of a stretch, but there are some Medicaid programs, like uh, in uh, Maryland, for example, uh, that are considering how to bring um, performance measures like kindergarten readiness into their um, uh, ACO-type uh, payment reforms in Medicaid. Um, now, it's not just, a, you know, as always, not just an issue of holding providers accountable for something they can't easily control. It's also about... Uh, making it uh, easier for, for providers to have an impact on these uh, um, uh, hard-to-control issues. And some of the most successful uh, Medicaid and, and pediatric ACO models are not only you know, kind of breaking down these silos and moving away from fee-for-service payments for health care, but are combining payments with pa combining other payment streams, uh, social services, community services, education services, uh, so that uh, um, you know, funds that uh, could be used, say, for a, 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 a pediatric practice to help staff up or support a nurse practitioner in a school or home visitors, social workers going to uh, uh, at-risk homes of, uh, of, uh, of two-year-olds can, in fact, show up as uh, uh, creditable uh, cost savings in these, in these more integrated systems. Now, this is still, you know, this is, these are examples of things that are not happening widely yet, but uh, where there is a lot of interest and I think a, a lot of potential for the future. Uh, we've been working a lot with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and their uh, emphasis on a culture of health and kind of shifting beyond just a, a medical focus uh, around uh, uh, support for children and pediatric support for children 
uh, to try to further these efforts as well. And I think uh, pediatrics will actually be at the forefront of, uh, of bringing in these uh, uh, non-medical um, funding streams and, and uh, non-medical influences on improving health outcomes uh, because they are so important for kids. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think we can build on a lot of the experience um, that pediatrics has had working in, in partnerships like that with non-traditional health care providers. So we are at the top of the hour, but I want to close with one final question. Dr. McClellan, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and make a prediction for us. We've gotten lots of questions around the issue of moving further away from fee-for-service, fee how far do you think we can get, and how long will it take for us? And let's restrict the, the question to just primary care. How far do you uh, think we can get on that trajectory to more fully capitated primary care? So uh, do, can we do primary question. care without fee-for-service? I, I definitely see a future for primary care without fee-for-service at all. There are some um, organizations that are getting pretty close to taking on full capitation management now. Uh, Examples like uh, Iora Health and uh, some of you may have been familiar with uh, Care More and some other um, practices that uh, uh, really have uh, moved farther in that direction. Um, I think more common, though, in the next uh, three to five years are uh, going to be practices that are comfortable with models where they're getting fee-for-service payments for, for some things. Maybe it's some specialized services, things, you know, kind of relatively um, not under their control where there's not a, a lot of... Uh, uh, as much concern about um, variations in cost and the like, but also that it'll get more comfortable with, you know, bigger PMPMs making up a significant share of their payments because it's going to become clearer that there's just some things that are easier to do when you've got control over the money and it's not tied to providing specific services. There are things that are easier to do to improve care for for your patients. So, you know, I I would uh, like to see and sort of hope to, I think we're going to see. Uh, over the next three to five years, uh, movement into at least this uh, kind of partial um, uh, accountable, you know, partial capitation, accountable care with some, you know, will be looked at as new financial risk for, for many medical practices. Um, and uh, I think that'll hopefully be done um, uh, in, in a way that uh, is effective and, and comes along sooner rather than later. That's why, why things like uh, uh, these Medicare payment reforms and more generally SDR reform is uh, is so important, um, but uh, we're not going to get you know radically away from fee for service for most of medical practice. Um, hopefully, these will be some models that, that may be a bit of a challenge, but that can really, uh, on net, reduce the, the the stress level and the frustrations that primary care practitioners are facing with um, payments today that just seem to keep getting squeezed and, and just don't focus on what really matters the most and what they'd like to do the most for their patients. Fantastic. Well, PCPCC certainly looks forward to continuing to partner with you and your team at Brookings as we continue to advocate for these models of care that really do, like you said and described so eloquently, you know, give some of the control over those resources back to the primary care team and let them really formulate and divide as a care team that works for the population of patients that they're serving at the, the highest quality and in line with those individual patient goals. So thank you so much again for your time. Uh, for those of you who are anxiously awaiting a copy of the slides in this presentation, we will have it available up on our website by the end of the day tomorrow for those colleagues that weren't able to participate live today. Again, I know we weren't able to get to all of your questions. If you do have some burning questions that you'd like um, to get a response to, you can send them to the staff here at the PCPCC, and we'll do the best job we can to get those questions answered. And again, we'll have lots of opportunities coming up in the future with PCPCC through subsequent webinars and our conferences and other engagements with all of you out there working so hard to improve the, the healthcare, transform, healthcare transformation built on strong primary care. So I encourage you to continue to participate in those. So thanks again and have a great afternoon.